Hey there, good morning everybody. 10 o'clock on Monday morning, the 14th of December. Hope that your day is off to a good start, which would mean your week is off to a good start. Heading into Christmas, what? Just about a week and a half away or so. And uh, we're covering the book of Luke to get in the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, ultimately the sacrifice of Christ. And so thanks for watching with us. Before we jump in, I want to answer a question that was asked of me. Let me look it up exactly so that I can uh, tell you. Marissa asked, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. She says, I'm participating in the 24 days of Luke, but I have a question. I was wondering what distinguishes Luke's gospel from the other three. Excellent question, Marissa. Um, if you go back to the very first lesson we did on Luke 1, we took some time to tell you how the four Gospels differentiate one from another, and it's pretty much in how they portray Christ. They're all written to a different audience, and so he's portrayed to that audience in different ways. The book of Matthew is written to the Jewish people. They're looking for the Messiah and the one who would sit on the throne of David. And so Christ is portrayed as a king in the book of Matthew, and he's portrayed as the son of God there. Then you go to Mark. Mark is written to the Romans. The Romans were very common people, blue-collar people, and so he is presented as the son of man to the Roman people, uh, just a prophet, that type of, of person. The book of Luke was written to the Greeks. The Greek people worshipped man. They idolized man. And so Christ is presented to uh, the Greeks through the book of Luke as the perfect man. And then you have the Gospel of John, which is written to the whole world, and Christ is portrayed in the book, in the Gospel of John, as the Redeemer of man, as God Himself. And so that's how the different Gospels uh, give a different perspective of who Christ is. It's the audience to who they're speaking and how they're representing Him. And so, Greeks uh, looking for a perfect human, uh, Christ is portrayed as that perfect man to them. Hope that helps a little bit. Uh, what it's basically doing, the four Gospels, is giving us four different pictures or perspectives. And one illustration that I like to use is of a car accident. If there's an accident in an intersection and it was witnessed by an auto mechanic, a doctor, an insurance adjuster, and a policeman, they're all going to tell you about the same accident, but they're going to tell you about it in different ways. The insurance adjuster is probably going to approach it from a matter of how much it would cost to repair the vehicles. Policeman's going to approach it from the perspective of who broke the law, who was at fault. The doctor might approach it from the perspective of the injuries sustained or potential industries. And the mechanic's going to tell you what it's going to take to get those cars fixed or if they can even be fixed. So same accident, but four different discussions about that accident. So that's how Luke is differentiated. Hope that helps. So chapter number 14, a shorter chapter here today, 35. What's happening here? Luke must have had a busy day and not a lot of time to write. And of course, it's the Lord inspiring him to write. So he put down what God wanted him to do. I love this chapter. It's one of my favorite. In fact, 14, 15, 16 are three of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Of course, I really have no particular uh, favorites. I, I enjoy a lot of things, but these three really stand out to me. So let's go ahead and pray and we will begin. Father, thank you for the study that we've enjoyed. I pray you'll bless it. Uh, help us this morning on a Monday morning. Maybe we're moving a little slow. Maybe there's some cobwebs in our brain yet. I pray you'd clear those away. Help us to learn and focus. Help us to be inspired, challenged, changed even from it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go, Luke 14, verse number one. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. So Christ is going to a head Pharisee, a leader Pharisee, and he's going over to his house to eat 
and they watched him. They're looking to pick him apart to find fault. Verse 2, and behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So usually Jesus just goes ahead and heals people, and then they criticize him for healing. And so this time he stops, and he finds this crippled man, and he says, uh, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? He asks them before he does it. And verse 4, they held their peace. So they don't even answer his question. And he took him and healed him and let him go. So they don't even answer him. So Christ goes ahead and heals him. And then he answers them saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? He said, you know, which of you guys, if you had one of your animals fallen in a pit, you wouldn't help that animal get out. So he's turning it around on them. And they could not answer him again to these things. They couldn't answer because they wouldn't implicate themselves. They're pleading the fifth, you understand. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them. So now he's going to give them a lesson in chosen humility deciding ahead of time that you're going to be a humble person. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thee be bidden of him. And he that bade thee in him come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowliest room. So he says, if you go to a wedding and you find that people are seated in different rooms, don't go to the highest, loftiest, most uh, exalted room. Don't do that. Because you might show up there, and then the hosts show up and say to you, hey, buddy, you're in the wrong place. Head to this other room instead. So what's Christ's advice? Verse 10, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, and look at this word, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. He says, so instead, sit in the lowest room. Because it's better to sit in the lowest and be promoted than to sit in the highest and be demoted. Notice too, the one that was proud, he wasn't called friend. But the one that was humble was called friend. People appreciate the company of humble people better than they do proud people. They enjoy hanging around people who don't brag on themselves, who don't boast of their achievements. They're just grateful uh, to have someone down to earth. And so the advice of Christ is, humble yourself and let others exalt you, instead of exalting yourselves and having others humble you. Verse number 11, and this is what I just said, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So the Lord is giving some advice here as well on serving people. Don't just serve people who can do something back for you. Now, this isn't saying that you can never have your own friends over or that you can never do something nice for someone else. What this is saying is don't always be doing things for other people that can do something back for you again. Don't make your life transactional. Hey, I had you over for dinner. You know, you need to have me over. Hey, I took you to a nice restaurant. You took me to McDonald's. Uh, you don't look to be paid back. Look to serve people for the sake of serving them. And make it a habit to serve people who can't do anything for you in return. Make it a habit to invest in people that can't give you anything back. Pour your life into people that can't do anything for you. That's what he's saying. Verse number 15, 
And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So <laughs> here's this self-righteous guy speaking up, saying, you know, uh, forget about having people over that can eat, uh, uh, to eat, that can then have you to their house or helping people. You know, it'll be a blessed thing when we all get to heaven and we can eat there in the presence of God. So he's... He's sort of undermining what Christ just said and, and trying to maybe direct the conversation elsewhere. And so that doesn't work. Jesus runs with it here in verse 16. And I'll read through this whole parable and then we'll discuss it. Then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper." So let's look at this in context. The man at the, the dinner table with Christ says, blessed are those that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Christ answers and basically tells him, there's going to be fewer people there than you think. And so he talks about this. He tells a story of a man preparing a great supper and bidding many to come. And when the servant invites these people they with one consent began to make excuse. And so what that means is they conspired together. Hey, you know what? Did you get the invitation to Joe's party? Yeah, I got it. I don't want to go. Yeah, neither do I. Well, what are you going to tell him? So they worked this out ahead of time. And they the excuses they give, one guy bought some land that he had to go see. Another guy bought an ox that he has to go prove. And another guy's gotten married and so married life is busy. Uh, so these three people make excuses for why they can't go to this supper. And again, they, they didn't want to go. And so they, they came up with these reasons. Now notice, all of these reasons are legitimate reasons, aren't they? Now, I mean, I would say, I don't know how many people buy land without seeing it first or buy oxen without proving them first. So I think there's a little bit of shaky ground. But what I'm getting at is these are things that could interfere with another invitation. These are things that could get in the way. And here's what is happening. They're not saying no to the supper. They're saying, you know, I'd like to come, but this I have to tend to this first. And that's what people do when it comes to salvation. Yeah, I'll get saved someday, but right now I'm doing this. Yeah, I'm going to get in church someday, but right now... I've got to take care of this. Yeah, I'm going to square my life away one day, but right now I got to do this. And it's a procrastination that's going to result in no, no, no ability to attend the supper. And so the master says, hey, go invite everybody you can find. Bring in the halt, the maimed, the poor, the blind. Don't limit the invitation to anyone. Bring anyone in who can. And so the servant does. They go out and they get as many people and there's still empty seats. There's still room at the table. And so the master says, go to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. I want my house filled. And so the servant's going to go back out and do that. And then he says, for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So it started out with, blessed are they that eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, not everybody's going to be eating bread that you think. Because not everybody has time to say yes to the gospel. They will make other excuses. They will, they will decline the invitation by default because they won't make time for the Lord. Verse 25, 
And there went great multitudes, and things are, if you thought that was tough, it gets even tougher. There went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow, what a way to start a conversation. Oh, you want to follow me? Do you hate your father and mother? Do you hate your wife and children? Do you hate your own life? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, well, then you can follow me. No, I don't hate those people. Well, you're not worthy to be my disciple. That's strong. Now, what does it mean? Because we're told to love our wives in Ephesians 5, and Jesus says, you got to hate your wife. So what is he saying? He's saying, your commitment to the Savior should be paramount to anything else in your life. Your commitment to serving God should come before anything else in your life. My family and I, thank God, we serve God together. But if there ever came a day when one of my kids said, you know, I don't think I want to go to church anymore, what would I do? Would I go, oh, okay, well, I'll stay home with you. I'd say, well, if you're not going, that's your decision. You're an adult, but I'm going. Well, well you should stick with your family, not over Christ. That's harsh, isn't it? How about this? How about the whole family follow Christ? But we read yesterday that three in a house will go one direction and two will go another. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but sometimes it is. And when it happens, what are you going to do? You've got to side with Christ. There's a song called, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've sung it. Uh, it was written by a man named Charles Weigel. It was written after Charles Weigel's wife left him. She came to him and said, I'm tired of the ministry, I'm tired of serving God, and I'm telling you now that unless you quit, I'm leaving you. And he said, I can't turn my back on what God's called me to do. And she left him. And he wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. That's an example of loving your Lord more than loving your father or mother or wife or children. We have to stay true to the Lord. And so when people try to pull us away, we've got to stay true to him. Now, uh, hopefully they follow suit. That's what you want. They don't always. Verse number 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is the way I interpret this, and I believe it wholeheartedly. We often look at a cross as a difficulty. And sure, it can be a difficulty, but this is how I view this. The cross is that instrument that Jesus used to give himself to others. And I think every Christian needs an instrument that they use to give themselves to others, a cross that they should bear. And so if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to be uh, one of his disciples, you've got to serve people. And the only way you can serve him is by serving the people that he loves and serving others. And so figure out a way to do that. Around our church, we try to keep it real simple. Sunday school classes and bus routes. And then there's some maintenance type jobs and so forth as well that need done. Cleaning and counting the uh, offerings and, and maintenance on the buildings and facilities and you name it, those things are there. Uh, so, But we, we've got to give ourselves to the Lord by means of an instrument and that's what the cross is. And then he gets into making sure that we know what we're getting ourselves into. Verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily after he had laid the foundations and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. And so he says, you know, you're not going to sit down to build a tower and not figure out how much it's going to cost you. You're going to figure out the plans first and what it'll cost you to decide if you've got what it takes to finish it. Because you don't want to get halfway into the project and then quit. And really, he's telling people here, you say you want to follow me. You better consider what it's going to cost you before you get into this. Because I don't want people quitting in the middle of it. I want you seeing it through. John Mark went off on the missionary journey. Halfway through, he went back home. That's what the Lord's talking about. John Mark didn't count the cost. Uh, let's see. There's another example. Verse 31. 
Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. So the example of a king going to war against another king. Do we figure out, can we get the victory here? And it comes down to it. You need to be willing to sacrifice everything if you'll be a disciple of Christ. Now that doesn't mean you can't be a Christian. You can, you can put your faith in Christ. You can be saved. But if you want to be a disciple, if you want to serve God, there are some expectations and requirements. And that requirement is all that you have. Are you willing to give everything you have to the Lord? Next verse. 34, salt is good. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So salt, if it has no taste, what good is it? Christians who have no willingness to, to dive in 100%, what good are they? That's harsh, isn't it? Don't get mad at me. Those were words in red, weren't they? The Lord Jesus taught that. Hey, he expects of his people dedication, faithfulness, servitude. We ought to give it to him, don't you think? All right, man, what's going on here? 22 minutes? That's short. That's even with answering Marissa's question. Hey, thanks for watching. Now, I got to tell you, things are going to be a little different this week. Uh, we have some doors that we're trying to get the gospel to. If you remember, we started the year out wanting to knock on every door in Flint. And here it is, December the 14th. We're almost to the end of the year, and we have a lot of doors left. In fact, thousands of doors left. So we have door hangers. We don't have the time to knock every door. The coronavirus really halted things this year. I lost an assistant pastor early in the year. I lost a second one later in the year. And uh, we were working as a team to try to get this done. And so here we are. I uh, got thousands of doors left. So what we did today, we went out this morning and uh, 8 o'clock, we're sitting in the car getting ready to head out and uh, get some flyers out. And we did until uh, about 9.30 or so. And now we're going back out. So what this is doing is it's eating into the time that I need to get some doors done. So every morning this week at 10 o'clock, there will be a broadcast. But I got to pre-record it so that I can not be interrupted as I go out. I don't like doing it that way. I like doing it live. I wish I could do it live, but I need to get these things out. And I've got a couple of folks that are helping me. And uh, if you're local and you want to help, please let me know. We'll, we'll get you involved and uh, we'll get it done together. But I've got thousands of doors, <laughs> over 10,000 doors. So uh, we got to get after it. So I'm going to record uh, the, the devotions. They will play at 10 a.m., and uh, I'd like you to stick around and watch them. I'm sorry that it's not live. Come Saturday, probably, maybe we'll be live again. I know Sunday morning live, but this week it's hammer time. I got to get this job done and put the pedal to the metal and get it done. So I hope you understand that. Thanks for watching. Like, love, share the post. Soon as we get off here, back to the streets we go. Again, if you're local, man, we could use the help. Let me know, all right? Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you tomorrow.